very much for that kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to visit Heidelberg. I wish I could be there in person, but unfortunately we live in strange times and are limited to these virtual seminars. But it's a real pleasure to see so many people here and I look forward to chatting with many of you after the talk. Uh, so I'm a professor at, at Dalhousie University. This is a picture here of our chemistry building on our beautiful campus in Halifax, Nova Scotia. My seminar today is going to focus on dispersion interactions in DFT for the first half of the talk and the second half of the talk uh, will then switch to applications to molecular crystal structure prediction. So dispersion interactions are ubiquitous across chemistry and physics. They affect a diverse range of phenomena such as determining the three-dimensional structure of biological molecules, such as proteins and DNA. They control molecular self-assembly, the interlayer interactions within layered materials, adsorption of molecules onto surfaces, phase transitions within molecular crystals, and very importantly for the second part of today's talk, molecular crystal packing. However, despite the ubiquity of dispersion in chemistry, it is not well described by conventional density functional theory methods, so we need to add dispersion correction to our base density functionals. The picture of dispersion that we use is the same one we explained to our first year chemistry students, and that is that dispersion it arises from interaction with instantaneous dipoles. So if you have a instantaneous dipole moment in the electron distribution of one atom or molecule, that can interact with an instantaneous dipole moment in the electron distribution of the second atom or molecule. And it's this interaction between the instantaneous dipole moments that gives rise to dispersion. Within the dispersion model we use in my group, uh, the exchange hole dipole moment method developed by myself and Axel Becker, the source of the instantaneous dipole moments is taken to be the dipole moment of the exchange hole. So what is the exchange hole? Well, this is a fundamental quantity in density functional theory, and it measures the depletion and probability of finding another same spin electron in the vicinity of a reference electron. So if we have a reference electron of some point in space, the exchange hole is going to measure the depletion and probability of finding a second same spin electron somewhere around that reference. So we have here uh, a sketch. We have the atomic nucleus, some reference electron, the uh, center of the exchange hole will be shifted a bit towards the reference electron. The center of the hole will have a positive charge, the electron a negative charge, giving rise to a non-zero dipole. Now, we could use the exact exchange hole in the dispersion method. Uh, however, the exchange hole, uh, the exact exchange hole is highly non-local. So it's problematic to use this highly non-local hole in uh, periodic solids or extremely large molecules. So as a result, we'd like to use a localized or density functional hole model. And the one we turn to is the becker roussel model. So here, the exchange hole is modeled as an off-center exponential function, uh, centered at distance b from the reference electron. So we have three parameters within this exchange hole model. We have the exponent, normalization and the displacement between the whole center and the reference electron. So these three parameters can be obtained by imposing three known exact constraints. And the three constraints we choose is that the model hole must be normalized to minus one electron and it must recover the same density and curvature at the reference point as the exact exchange hole. If we impose these three constraints, we can then solve for our three parameters big A, little a, and b in terms of the electron density, its gradient, the kinetic energy density, and the Laplacian, which are the same ingredients that go into a meta GGA uh, density functional approximation. So we're going to use this becker roussel model for our exchange hole throughout. So now that we have our exchange hole model, we can obtain an expression for the dispersion energy from second order perturbation theory. So our perturbation here is that we're going to interact the multiple moments, the dipole moment and higher order multiple moments of the electron in its exchange hole in one atom A 
with the multiple moments of the electron in the exchange hole of atom B, and that gives rise to a perturbation. Within second order perturbation theory and the closure approximation, we can then obtain our second order energy correction in terms of the expectation value of the square of the perturbation divided by some average uh, excitation energy denominator. And that denominator can be obtained from the second order perturbation theory applied to atomic polarizability. So if we now expand our expression for the dispersion energy, we obtain this expression where we have a sum over all atom pairs in the system I and J. We have a leading order dispersion term of the form C6 over R to the 6, as you'd expect, for example, from the letter John 612 potential. Um, this comes from the dipole-dipole interactions. We also have higher order terms arising from the higher order multiple moments. The next term is the form C8 over R to the 8, which arises from the dipole-quadrupole interactions. The C10 term arises from the dipole-octopole and quadrupole-quadrupole interactions. And in principle, we can keep going with this uh, expansion to arbitrarily high order. However, in practice, we truncate the series at the C10 term. These higher order terms will have negligible effect to the dispersion energy. The Fs here are damping functions, which I'll discuss in a moment. The dispersion coefficients, the C6, C8, and C10, are non-empirical and um, depend on the atomic polarizabilities and expectation values of the exchange hole multiple moments. For example, the C6 coefficient has this form that involves expectation values of the exchange hole dipole moments, these, these Ms here. And C8 and C10 will depend on higher order multiple moments. The damping function is needed to prevent divergence of the dispersion energy for small intermuclear separations. And the form that we choose for the damping function is this rational form here that involves a sum of van der Waals radii of the individual component atoms. Note that there are two empirical parameters in our definition of the van der Waals radii. And these are the only two parameters that appear in our dispersion model. Uh, these A1 and A2 are fit for use with a particular exchange correlation functional and are then fixed for further calculations. So these are not something that change with system. Um, they're, they're fit once at the outset for a particular exchange correlation function. The dispersion correction is um, uses a post-SCF correction, so it's added to a base density functional energy. So our total energy is the energy from our favorite uh, base density functional plus our XDM dispersion correction. The calculation of the dispersion energy is fast compared to the base density functional. So if you can afford to do a DFT calculation on a system, you can always afford to do a dispersion correction. So really, there's, there's no excuse not to use dispersion correction uh, when doing modern DFT calculations. The, the cost of it is negligible, and it will generally increase your, the accuracy of your calculation. Our XDM dispersion method is implemented for both molecular and solid state calculations. If you're interested in doing molecular calculations, you can use the popular Gaussian software along with our POST-G code that you can download from our website. Uh, you can also use POST-G with, with other um, molecular codes such as Psi4 or NWChem. Uh, for the solid state, um, XDM is implemented in the distribution of quantum espresso. And that's the main code that we use. Um, if you're interested in numerical orbitals, you can also use XDM with Siesta. Uh, we've been working to implement XDM in uh, Avenit and in CASTEP as well. So if you're interested in using either one of those codes, that should be uh, available very soon. Uh, we're also just starting to work on an implementation of XDM in FHI Ames, uh, which I know is very popular in Germany and it's a very nice code from what we've done with it so far. So we're hoping to have that in another um, year or so. All right, so when we parameterize our XDM damping function, we use a fit set of 49 molecular dimers. And these are small molecular dimers for which we have very high level reference data from the cluster theory uh, in a complete basis set limit. 
So our, our gas phase dimers here include a range of interactions. Um, dispersion as in the methane dimer, high sacking as in the benzene dimer, dipole and use dipole interactions, dipole dipole interactions, hydrogen bonding interactions, and even some mixed interactions, uh, which is in the phenol dimer, where you have a combination of hydrogen bonding and high stacking. Uh, so we parameterize the A1 and A2 to minimize the uh, RMS error for uh, this Canon and Beckman 49 set. And again, those parameters are fixed. So we find that the parameters that we fit for even these small organic molecules are, are transferable to the remainder of the periodic table. To illustrate the importance of higher order dispersion terms, we can consider how the errors for our Hanneman Beckett fit set, as well as a benchmark set, the X23 set of lattice energies of molecular crystals, depend on the um, order of dispersion terms included in our series expansion. So simplistic dispersion models, um, particularly the, those used in force fields, only include a C6 dispersion term. And if you add a C6 dispersion term, you do obtain not too bad uh, performance on the KV49 and the X23 with errors of one to two uh, kilocalories per mole. However, if you include the C8 term, the dispersion energy, you're roughly having your errors. So the C8 term is really essential for good performance. You can get the errors down to under half a kcal per mole for the KV49 or under one kcal per mole for the X23. Including up to C10 gives you a, a slight benefit in performance across both of the sets, but the C8 itself is, is really essential. There's a dramatic increase in accuracy, both including the C8 as well as the C6. Uh, a further illustration of this is for a solid state system. Uh, graphite is the classic solid state example where dispersion is important. So we're looking here at the exfoliation energy or the energy to pull apart the graphite layers, uh, graphene layers within graphite. Uh, so here we have potential energy curve um, for a base density functional. So this is showing how a base DFT method does not include dispersion physics. Without dispersion, you have an entirely repulsive potential energy curve here. Uh, if you add a C6 dispersion term, you get a nice binding curve, but the exfoliation energy is significantly smaller in magnitude than what you've obtained from experiment or a uh, benchmark calculation from um, quantum Monte Carlo, for example. It's only if you include the C8 term or C8 and C10 that you obtain good performance uh, with respect to our reference data. Uh, as a final dramatic example of the importance of C8, we can consider Stefan Grimma's S12L set. So this is a set of 12 supermolecular complexes where there's experimental data for equilibrium binding constants. And Stefan's group um, performed calculations to do, um, back correct the experimental data for thermal and solvent effects to come up with a set of, of reference binding energies. So for this S12L benchmark, we can see how our mean absolute error depends on the order of dispersion terms. So with C6 only, we have an error uh, in excess of 20 kcal per mole. That's about four hydrogen bonds. So this is really quite poor performance. Whereas if we include the C8 term, we improve our accuracy by a factor of 10. There's only two kcal per mole. Again, adding C10 gives you a slight improvement in performance. So the C8 term is, is really essential to be included in this version model. C6 alone doesn't give you uh, all the necessary physics. The other important feature of our XDM dispersion method is that the dispersion coefficients are non-empirical. They depend on the electron density and its derivatives, meaning that they're going to be dependent on local chemical environment of an atom within a molecule or solid. Uh, so here we can look at how the dispersion coefficients change uh, for a few um, simple chemical examples. So our first example is for the water dimer. So within the water dimer, you have one water that acts as the hydrogen bond donor, and the second water acts as the hydrogen bond acceptor. 
and you can see that there's a significant change in the C6 dispersion coefficient depending on whether the water is acting as the filter or the accepted molecule. And this arises from both uh, changes in atomic polarizability or molecular polarizability and the uh, exchange hole dipole moment of the place. Going to the solid state, we can look at the change in dispersion coefficient carbon in graphite versus diamond. So chemically, we would expect a larger C6 coefficient for graphite with the sp2 carbon and the delocalized pi system as compared to diamond. And we see that's indeed the case and that the change in dispersion coefficient is coming entirely from the change in the uh, exchange hole dipole moment. Uh, final dramatic example is for the silver atom in different environments. So if you have a free metal atom in the gas phase, that's going to have very loosely bound electrons and be quite unstable. Uh, and that gives rise to a very high dispersion coefficient. As soon as you put that silver atom into bulk, uh, either in bulk silver or a bulk silver chloride, um, you see significant reduction in the dispersion coefficients. And again, this is coming entirely from the change in the exchange hole by so um, it's really important that we have a sophisticated dispersion method that depends on properties of the, of the electron density to capture these um, atomic many body effects or electronic many body effects coming from different chemical environments. All right, so to illustrate why having uh, reasonable dispersion coefficients for metals is important, we can consider a, a few benchmark systems involving um, metal surfaces or metal containment systems. The first is for molecular surface absorption. So we can look at benzene absorption on uh, free noble metals, copper, silver, and gold. And if you have a highly empirical dispersion method like D2, uh, where it's just all atom typed, the dispersion coefficients for a metal atom look a lot like a metal atom in the gas phase. And as we saw, those are very much too high and lead to significant overbinding of molecules to a metal surface. So we have quite large errors with PDEV2. This is improved a bit with TS and V3, which are two other popular dispersion corrections from the Chenko or Grima groups, um, but there's still significant overbinding. And it's only when you have density dependent dispersion corrections like the non local van der Waals methods, our XDM methods, or uh, Chenko's many body dispersion method that you obtain good agreement with reference data, which you're able to have a response in the dispersion coefficients to the fact that we've gone to now a metal surface as opposed to a free metal atom. Uh, similarly, uh, we can look at graphene absorption on our noble metal surfaces for a larger set of metals here. And again, uh, our XDM method with our, our base functional of choice uh, gives improved agreement over the LDA, which is unfortunately very popular for a lot of this uh, surface chemistry or a couple of um, of all sensitive functionals. Uh, a, well-known problem uh, that's come up in recent years for uh, DFT dispersion corrections is um, layered materials. So here we're looking at exfoliation energy again, energy to pull apart layers, but we're now looking at a set that is uh, comprised mostly of transition metal like halogenides, things like molybdenum disulfide. So here again, we tend to get overly large dispersion coefficients for the metal atoms and also for the calcogen atoms within these TMBCs if one uses a um, non-density dependent dispersion correction. So with uh, PBETS or several of the Grima dispersion methods, you see significant overestimation of the exfoliation energy of these layered materials due to an overestimation of dispersion coefficients. Uh, conversely, with a few of the non-local van der Waals methods, the exfoliation energies have good agreement with reference data, but we have overly large interlayer lattice parameters. Um, it's only when we have uh, some of the non-local methods, our XDM methods, and the fractionally ionic variant of, of many body dispersion that we obtain good performance for both of these quantities, the exfoliation energy and lattice parameters.
So again, this, this emphasizes the need for a density dependent dispersion correction. It's able to respond to changes in the chemical environment of an atom. Um, in the physics literature, again, this is uh, typically referred to as um, electronic many body effects that would be included in a many body dispersion method. All right, and the final benchmark I wanted to highlight uh, relates to carbon, and I know that many of you are studying carbon. Um, so we recently um, published a paper in collaboration with experimentalists at Dalhousie and internationally um, revisiting the relative stability of diamond and graphite. So the experimental groups performed some new and very highly precise measurements for the relative um, free energies and enthalpies of these two carbon allotropes. So the solid lines here are the most recent experimental data and the dashed lines are results from dispersion corrected DFT using two different base functionals with our XDM dispersion method. One of them is the PDE zero hybrid, and the other is a comparable 25% hybrid using our, our B86B PDE functional. And as you can see, our, our two base functionals bracket the experimental data very nicely. Uh, so again, this is a system where dispersion is very important uh, for the uh, graphite allotrope and using a sufficiently accurate dispersion method and density functional, you can obtain very good agreement with experiment for this solid stability. All right, so uh, I'm going to shift gears now and focus uh, exclusively on molecular crystals for the remainder of the talk. So as I mentioned previously, there's the X23 benchmark for the lattice energies of molecular and uh, here's some mean absolute errors for a variety of dispersion corrections. So I want to highlight again our uh, functional of choice, this B86B exchange functional, PBE correlation functional with our XDM dispersion correction, which gives um, best performance on this X23 set. So we're able to obtain very good performance for the absolute uh, lattice energy, the sublimation of the piece of molecular crystals. Um, and we're very interested in molecular crystals uh, due to the problem of crystal structure prediction. So uh, first, crystal structure, first principles crystal structure prediction refers to the problem of going from a two-dimensional diagram of chemical structure to a three-dimensional crystal packing. So if you imagine all of the molecules as Lego bricks, um, there are very, very many ways you could possibly stack the Lego bricks together to build a molecular crystal. The particular packing is going to affect the physical properties of the crystal and will affect properties such as the sublimation energies, melting points, solubilities, and uh, a particular relevance, relevance in the pharmaceutical industry and the bioavailability of the drug and system to be determined by the solubility. So if you want to predict the three-dimensional crystal packing by crystal structure prediction, that requires extensive structure generation and also requires highly accurate energy ranking, which can perhaps be obtained by a dispersion correcting density function method. We've seen that our methods give very good performance for the lattice energies, but how do they do for the relative energies of multiple crystal packing? So to assess this, uh, we need a benchmark where we can directly measure uh, relative energies of different packing arrangements. And to do this, we turn to chiral compounds. So if you have a chiral molecule, you have two enantiomers. And you can have two different types of molecular crystal for these types of compounds. The first is a conglomerate where you have a single enantiomer in the, uh, in the molecular crystal. The second is a racemate crystal where you have both enantiomers together in the crystal and a one-to-one -one stroke to metric ratio. So experimentally, you can set up a ternary phase equilibrium between the conglomerate crystal, the racemate crystal, and dissolved enantiomers in solution. And if you let that equilibrate, you'll reach a characteristic chiral eutectic point uh, where you can experimentally measure the enantiomeric excess of the dissolved 
name collision solution. And from a simple thermodynamic model, you can relate that enantiomeric excess to the relative energy difference between the conglomerate and racemate crystals. So my collaborator, Jason Hine at the University of British Columbia performed a series of these experimental measurements for a number of common amino acids and a few other chiral compounds. We were able to use this as a benchmark of our dispersion correcting density functional method at predicting the relative energy difference between the conglomerate and racemate phases. So here's the results. So the black curve here is the result from our, our thermodynamic model on the previous slide. And you can see that the enantiomeric excess is extremely sensitive to the relative energy difference due to the exponential. Uh, so very small energy differences can result in very large differences in enantiomeric excess. The blue points um, are showing the results of the experiments and calculations. So the error in the computed enantiomeric excess is the difference between the blue points and the black line vertically. So the largest error here we see is for the proline uh, amino acid, where we have an enantiomeric excess error in excess of 40%. However, this is actually a fairly small energy error, the energy error being the difference between the blue point and the black line horizontally. So we have less than a kcalc mole error in absolute energy. That translates into 40% EP. Um, so the clustering of the points around the line shows that our dispersion corrected DFT is really quite good at uh, predicting the relative energy differences between these. Okay, so we now want to start performing crystal structure prediction. So we need to have potential candidate crystal structures generated by some method. Typically, one does this with force field methods. So we collaborated with uh, the Kim Jelfs group at Imperial College. Uh, and here, uh, they used the W99 force field to uh, predict 50 candidate um, crystal packings for the 1Aza 6 helicene molecule shown here. This is a, a chiral molecule, so we can have conglomerate and uh, racinate phases. So uh, Kim's group uh, sent us this data obtained with W99, and this is a crystal energy landscape. So each of these points corresponds to a different candidate molecular crystal packing, and we're plotting the relative energy of these forms versus the density. The um, black points here correspond to the enantiopure or conglomerate crystal structures. So the uh, W99 method did a very good job of predicting the most stable enantiopure crystal. Uh, the lowest energy enantiopure crystal from the force field uh, is in agreement with the external oxygen structure. The blue points correspond to the different racemic candidates. And here it turned out that the experimental uh, racemate structure was the 50th ranked uh, structure energetically. Um, that's why they sent us 50 structures. Um, so from this landscape alone, one would infer that uh, kinetics is very important in this particular crystallization uh, to explain why experimentally this high energy polymorph is obtained as opposed to all of these other lower energy receiving crystal packages. However, if you uh, re-rank the energies of these structures with a dispersion corrected DFT, we see quite a large change in the crystal energy landscape. Again, the um, experimental conglomerate structure is the lowest energy of the enantiopure candidates, um, but now the lowest energy racemic structure also corresponds to the experimental structure of the rest. So one might wonder which of these pictures is correct, and thankfully, because this is a chiral compound, we're able to measure experimentally the enantiomeric excess and use that to determine the relative energy difference between the uh, racemic and enantiopure phases. So with the force field, uh, we had the 
the Walmart to be an entry pure is more stable with the DFT. We had the uh, racemate is more stable. So experimentally, they found an uh, EE of 74%, uh, which gave us a relative energy uh, between 0.5 and 0.6 take out mole in favor of the racemate. Um, so that most closely matched our uh, DFT crystal energy bonding scheme. So based on this, uh, we're quite confident that at least for this compound, our dispersion part of DFT is doing a very good job of predicting reliable crystal energy landscapes. And also we feel that the role of kinetic effects in crystallization may have been overestimated uh, previously in the literature since uh, many of the landscapes have been predicted using uh, perhaps less accurate force flow All right, so a ongoing theme in my group is to develop methods for a more efficient and more accurate crystal structure prediction. So we can consider the process of CSP um, as akin to a filtering. We can start off by generating thousands or tens of thousands of candidate crystal structures and obviously we can't do high level energy ranking on all of those structures. So we need to somehow uh, limit our candidates to only those that are most promising to carry forward to high level methods. Typically initial force film ranking is accurate enough to narrow down the structure space to a couple of hundred candidates. Um, but we would need to carry forward perhaps 100, 200 or more candidates to ensure inclusion of the experimental structure due to the uh, less accurate nature of the force field metrics. Uh, and even then, it's too expensive to do DFT on 100 to 200 candidates in many cases. So we need efficient refinement methods to shortlist the candidates from the force field. So we're going to borrow uh, the composite method approach from molecular quantum chemistry. So composite methods are things like the G1, G2, G3 model chemistries. And they're characterized by performing a geometry optimization with a low level of theory. Um, this is done because typically geometry optimization is fairly insensitive to choices in method and basis set, but is the computationally expensive step uh, since it requires many energy and force evaluations. Conversely, we then do high level of theory calculations for the single point energies, since single point energies are much more sensitive to the method and basis, basis set details, but are computationally quick and single energy evaluation. The notation for these is usually written as high slash slash low. So we have the energy method followed by the geometry method. So our uh, proposal for a composite method is to perform geometry optimizations with a small basis set, a double zeta plus polarization uh, basis set using finite support uh, numerical orbitals and the siesta code. And then our high level method is uh, the plane wave pseudopotential uh, on espresso code. And um, the results I've shown so far for crystals have all been carried out with on espresso and projector augmented wave. So if we consider the performance for our X23 set of lattice energies, we can see the advantages of a composite method. So we have our uh, highly accurate uh, PAW approach with quantum espresso. This gives the statistics we saw previously, a uh, mean absolute error of under one kcal per mole, but this is quite an expensive method. If we look at only the double zeta plus polarization, uh, small basis set method, our um, errors are about a factor of two larger, but the method is very much fast. The composite approach is an attempt at the best of both worlds, since the mean absolute error is effectively identical to the high level method, but the calculation is a factor of five or more faster. Um, so we, we hope to be able to use the composite method to increase the efficiency of a molecular crystal structure. So to illustrate the power of the composite method, uh, we're going to consider crystal structure prediction for uh, a couple of um, 
active pharmaceutical ingredients. So for these two compounds, 5-fluorouracil and olanzapine, we obtained structures and initial force field rankings from uh, Sally Price's online database. And we then performed re-ranking using our composite approach. All right, so here's some results. Uh, first of all, for 5-fluorouracil, for this particular compound, there's two experimentally uh, known polymorphs, form one and form two. Uh, with the force field method, form two is predicted to be the most stable of all the candidate structures, uh, but there are very, very many uh, candidate polymorphs predicted to be more stable than the known form one. If we consider then redoing this crystal energy landscape with our composite method, we obtain a, a very different uh, energy landscape. And now form one and form two are predicted to be the two lowest energy candidates. Um, what's very nice here is that form one is known to be the more stable form experimentally, and that's recovered with the EFT. The reason that form one is um, predicted to be so artificially high in energy with the force field is that it contains uh, fluorine fluorine contacts, which are ill described by um, the force field used here. Our second example is olanzapine, and uh, olanzapine has uh, four known polymorphs. Actually, at the time we had started this study, there were only three known polymorphs, uh, form one, form two, and form three. And for form three, the X-ray structure actually hasn't been solved. Uh, there's only uh, powder pattern data. So the um, structure for form three is actually a proposed structure, um, but hasn't been uh, rigorously confirmed by bicycle crystal x-ray. And while we were conducting this study, a, a fourth polymer, form four, was experimentally isolated. So with the uh, force field landscape, uh, forms one and four are quite low energy, but not necessarily the lowest energy. Uh, and the metastable forms two and three are higher than a very many candidates. Re-ranking this with our composite method gives a very nice result where all four experimental forms are the four lowest uh, candidates on our crystal energy landscape. Also the two stable forms, form one and four, are more stable than the metastable uh, polymorphs forms two and three. And we get the correct ordering with form one being more stable than this was a, a very nice success for our composite method. It allows us to perform expensive CSP calculations in a much more reasonable computational time. We can perform calculations with a composite method like this in a few weeks as opposed to a few months with full plane rate. All right, so in the last 10 minutes or so, um, we're going to have a, a caveat um, to illustrate that um, while very promising for molecular crystals, um, there are still some problems with DFT. Um, so this will be a bit of a cautionary tale. So in my opinion, the largest outstanding error in DFT today is the localization error. So this refers to a problem that um, is common in many density functionals, in particular those uh, that are GGA methods or hybrids with very small amounts of exact exchange mixing. And these methods significantly overestimate uh, charge transfer in many systems. So to illustrate this, we can consider a two-site model. So consider we have two potential energy wells that are degenerate, and we have a single um, charge that can occupy these potential energy wells. So if we can consider an electron between these two wells, we can put the electron in this well and no charge in this well, or we can put the electron over here, no charge over here, or we can have a linear combination of those where we have some fraction of the electron in either well. Because the potential energy wells are degenerate, each of those situations should give you an equal energy. However, with uh, GGA methods, the situation where we have a fractional charge in each potential energy well is going to be predicted to be significantly more stable than the extremes of localized charge. 
A more common example chemically uh, is not having a single charge localized in, in two wells, but uh, having the case where you can have a neutral molecular dimer, a zwitter ionic or charge transfer molecular dimer, or some situation that's part way. And again, the fractionally charged situation where you have a fractional positive charge on one molecule and a fractional negative charge on the second molecule is artificially predicted to be too stable with um, many GGA methods. So we can summarize the localization error uh, in the statement that the localized charges are predicted to be too stable relevant to localized charges. So there's some classic examples of this. Um, the first example and the simplest example is the stretched H2 plus model. So for H2 plus, it's a one electron system. We can solve the Schrodinger equation exactly. And because it's a one electron system, Hertie-Fock theory is going to be exact. We can look at a potential energy curve for H2 plus with Hertie-Fock theory. We get this association limit um, correctly recovered, giving us the energy of a hydrogen atom and a proton at nuclear separation. Uh, however, due to symmetry, the actual electron density distribution here is such that you would have half an electron around one uh, nucleus and half an electron around the second nucleus association limit. That gives us a fractionally charged distribution and that will be overly stabilized by uh, GGA and hybrid DFT methods. So here I'm showing results for B-lip and B-3-lip, but you can pick your favorite um, GGA and hybrid methods. With the GGA, you have a dissociation limit that's far, far too low in energy due to overstabilization of the fractional charge distribution. And adding in some amount of exact exchange in a hybrid will improve the dissociation li limit somewhat, but you would need to go to full exact exchange to recover the exact dissociation limit. This is an example of what's known as energy-driven delocalization error, since the density um, predicted by a GGA method is effective Correct, but the energy is um, significantly overstabilized. The second example is a case of what's known as density driven delocalization error, where the electron density predicted by a GGA method itself is qualitatively incorrect. The example here is a solvated chloride anion in, uh, surrounded by six water molecules. One would expect the majority of the charge to be localized on the chloride. Conversely, in a GGA calculation, the excess electron is spread out over the entire system to be localized uh, between the chloride and all of the water molecules. Uh, so while these um, examples of delocalization error are well known for gas-based calculations, very little is known about delocalization error in the solid state uh, beyond the well-known problem of band gap underestimation. Okay, so um, a couple of years ago, Graham Day from Southampton University uh, visited us here at Dalhousie and gave a seminar. And in chatting after the seminar, Graham was telling us about uh, some work that his group had done looking at a set of 350 organic co-crystals. And this group had optimized the structures of all of these co-crystals with dispersion corrected DFT and found a very odd result for six of these co-crystals. Uh, what, what this group found is that for these six co-crystals, the geometry optimization did not return a co-crystal. Instead, there was a transfer of a proton from an organic acid to an organic base and the calculation would give the geometry of a organic salt. So this, um, this made me think of delocalization error going from a case of um, neutral procrystal to an ironic salt. Um, so that prompted us to do some calculations on these um, six uh, particular uh, organic procrystals. So these are the, the six compounds we considered, and they're um, CSD codes. They're all organic acid-based co-crystals. And the problem with these organic acid-based co-crystals is that predicting whether the salt or co-crystal will form um, can be straightforward if you have very different pKa's, but if the 
assets and bases have similar PKAs, then it can be very difficult to predict a priori whether the salt and poker salt will perform. And as we saw in these six examples, that can also be very difficult to predict with PPT. Uh, what can happen is that you can have the proton transfer from the acid to the base, giving the salt form shown. So to determine if this really is a delocalization error problem, we performed calculations on these uh, six compounds with a series of dispersion effective DFT methods with increasing fractions of exact exchange mixing. The idea being here that with low fractions of exact exchange mixing, you would expect to see the localization error that could be corrected with high fractions of exact exchange mixing. So with either the PBE GGA or the PBE zero hybrid with 25% exact exchange, we performed calculations on all six of these molecular crystals, starting from the experimental reference structure, and in all cases found that the optimization converged uh, to the organic salt resulting from proton transfer. With the PBEH3C hybrid, which has an increased amount, 42% exact exchange, we now found that geometry optimization from the experimental co-crystal structure would recover the co-crystal. However, if we perform a second set of geometry optimization starting from the salt geometry obtained with the GGA, for three of the six cases, we would again recover the salt structure. And moreover, that salt was found to be more stable than the co-crystal. It was only going to full exact exchange that we recovered the co-crystal structure, regardless of choice of starting geometry. So this is the first example, to my knowledge, uh, for the solid state where delocalization error doesn't just affect the energy, but can also qualitatively affect the chemical structure of, uh, of the system. However, using full exact exchange is um, not going to work in all cases either. We can also um, pick a couple of similar compounds where the salt form is known to be more stable based on uh, bond lengths and x-ray structures, perform geometry optimization and um, spuriously recover the co-crystal form uh, with full exact exchange in some cases. So while it works well for co-crystals, full exact exchange um, doesn't necessarily uh, retain the experimental known salt structures. What's going on here is that we have a competition between two different potential energy wells. For each of these systems, we can have a particular well corresponding to the co-crystal form and a second well corresponding to the salt form. With the GGA functional, we shift the balance of these uh, potential energy wells uh, drastically in favor of the salt structure, uh, such that the co-crystal is not even a bound minimum. With Full exact exchange, we can shift this in the other direction such that the co-crystal is vastly stabilized and the salt is metastable or not bound. And we can then tune the fraction of exact exchange to get basically any answer you want between these two extremes. And we can shift the relative energy of the salt and co-crystal form just based on the fraction of exact exchange. So using DFT to study these acid-based co-crystals and salts is unreliable. We can get any answer we want depending on the functional we choose. All right, so that brings me to the end of the talk. Uh, so to summarize uh, what we've seen today, hopefully I've demonstrated that inclusion of a C8 term is essential for an accurate dispersion method that changes in chemical environment can cause very large changes in dispersion coefficients, and one uh, should use a density-dependent dispersion correction. That our DFT-XDM method is promising for molecular crystal structure prediction, and one can use it as part of the composite method, where low levels of theory are used for geometry optimization and high levels for energy evaluation to make crystal structure prediction more efficient. And finally, despite some impressive successes for dispersion predictive DFT for molecular crystals, uh, the localization error remains problematic and one must take care um, not to apply DFT to uh, systems where the localization error is very significant 
or if you do apply the FTP systems to pick an appropriate function. Um, the dramatic example here is for acid based glucosis, where the FT should be used and taken with a very large grain of salt. All right, so I'd like to wrap up by uh, thanking my group members, uh, group of alumni, and collaborators. I'd uh, particularly like to uh, highlight uh, Luc LeBlanc here, uh, who is a former PhD student in my group that uh, performed a lot of the calculations I showed today, dealing with crystal structure prediction and the acid base uh, of crystal work. I'd also like to highlight some of my collaborators, uh, Axel Becker here at Dalhousie, Ray and Day at Southampton, Jason Hine at UBC, Tim Jelps at Imperial, and uh, the other researchers that were involved in the um, graphic diamond work, Ray and White, and which was responsible. I'd like to uh, thank all of you for your attention, and I'd be very happy to answer any questions. Thanks.